to those watching, um, welcome everyone. We're gonna take a, a minute or two just to let everyone fill in. Um, so we'll get started soon. And for those of you filing in, um, we will take about a minute uh, before we start um, to let the room fill up. Okay, it looks like uh, we've gotten most everyone who's coming now. So um, I want to welcome everyone and thank you for joining us this evening here in DC or morning in Seoul, depending on where you're watching from. Um, I'm Jenny Town. I'm a senior fellow here at the Stimson Center and director of our 38 North program. Um, we're pleased you can join us for what will be a short series of events on the history and future of the US-South Korea Alliance. And tonight's program is meant to take a look back at where we started and see how history can help, help us better understand some of the challenges we face in alliance relations today. Everything from the structure and longevity of the alliance to the thorny issue of US troop presence on the peninsula, to the tensions of growing the alliance beyond the military sphere and even renewed interest in a South Korean nuclear weapons program. Um, I'd like to thank the Korea Foundation and Koch Institute for their generous support of this research and would also like to note that we will have an event next week as well on March 31st that will be more forward looking about how the alliance should evolve against a growing North Korean nuclear threat and for that program we'll be joined by General Vincent Brooks, the former commander of US Forces Korea and now chairman of the Korea Defense Veterans Association KDVA. Uh, as well as General Ho Young Lin, who's now vice chair of KDVA as well. Um, but for tonight, we're pleased to feature this discussion with our 38 North fellow, Clint Work, and renowned expert Richard Lawless to talk us through where we've been and what that means for today. So Clint is a fellow here at 38 North, and prior to joining Stimson, he was an assistant professor at the University of Utah's Asia campus in South Korea and a regular foreign policy writer for The Diplomat. At Stimson, Clint has organized and led congressional engagement on Korean peace and security issues, including a Senate-focused Korea study group. Um, and he's also worked with a broad range of universities and state and local organizations throughout the country to foster public engagement on US-Korea relations. Richard Lawless is a former career operations officer in the CIA and the founder of the telecommunications consulting firm, US Asia Development Corporation. He's also the founder and past chairman of the Boston-based Moto Labs LLC and is currently a senior partner in NMV Consulting, a national security advisory firm. He served as the Undersecretary of Defense for Asian and Pacific Affairs from 2002 to 2008 under Secretaries Donald Rumsfeld and Robert Gates. In this position, he was responsible for negotiating alliance relations with South Korea and Japan, the strategic partnership with Singapore, um, and was the deputy chief of the US delegation for the six party talks in Beijing. So we have a lot of knowledge here, a lot of experience here on this issue. Um, and we're really excited um, to have this conversation. Um, so Clint, you know, tonight's discussion is based heavily on research you've been doing over the past year that builds on your previous dissertation research. So I wonder if you could just start us off by giving us a quick overview of your project to set the context for tonight's discussion. Sure. Uh, thank you very much, Jenny, for you know moderating tonight's event, but also your support uh, for my research in general. And also, Richard, thank you very much for joining us. Richard was initially a subject of my archival research, as his name popped up uh, about events in the South Korea in the in the seventies, and has since become a, a sort of more contemporary research subject as I've interviewed him and, and culled from his extensive experience that Jenny referenced. So the research project, which is uh, part of a book project and also some shorter policy papers, which will be coming out uh, relatively soon, looks at what Jenny said, the sort of overall history and evolution of the US force presence on the Korean Peninsula. And it's an extension of my PhD work, which focused in great detail on the 1970s and specifically President Jimmy Carter's failed 
troop withdrawal policy from South Korea. He came into office intending to remove all U.S. ground combat forces from the country, essentially failed completely in implementing this policy. Um, but when I started to look at this case, I became very interested in just the, the profound opposition he faced in trying to implement this policy from, from really all angles and due to a myriad of different reasons, from his own, his own administration, Congress, the wider U.S. foreign policy establishment, um, from field commanders on the Korean Peninsula, and from allied capitals throughout the region, uh, not the least of which, of course, Seoul. Uh, and so I, I decided it, I was so sort of, uh, I found it so quizzical that an overwhelming opposition that I wanted to look at the larger scope of this, of this force presence history. So I've, this project sort of expands backwards and forwards from the, the Carter case and looks at all the different cases where a U.S. president, both Democrat and Republican administrations, have attempted to or have reduced, realigned, or in Carter's case, attempted to withdraw forces from Korea, based on the logic essentially that the U.S. force presence is such a critical component of the security architecture on and really around the Korean Peninsula, that it's in these, these moments of change or potential change that really fundamental questions arise about the nature of that presence the division of labor in the alliance. And also I have found really sticky underlying patterns and sort of inertial qualities of the relationship really come to the fore. Um, and, and I guess the last thing I'll say, Jenny, because I think it's just important to repeat, and I think most Korea watchers know this, but casual observers may not, is the really simple but, but compelling fact that U.S. combat forces have been stationed in South Korea for nearly the entirety of its sovereign existence. The only exception of that is from June of 1949 to when the Korean War broke out in June of 1950. So that event has sort of cut really deep what I would call psychological grooves in the mind of both ROC and US, US policymakers about the importance of that presence. So we'll get into much more detail from here, but I think that can help sort of contextualize how I've gotten here. Thanks, Clint. That gives us a really good um, overview of where tonight's discussion is going. Um, I do want to encourage our audience along the way, uh, if you do have questions, to feel free to put them in the Q&A box at any time. Um, we will get to them later, but it's good to see what's coming in and what's on your mind, especially um, as we go along. So um, with that, uh, you know, in tonight's discussion, I wonder if we could take a step back first and, and really think about, um, given the division of the Korean Peninsula, given that this division was never meant to be permanent. Um, when the U.S. ROC Alliance was established in 1954, did U.S. policymakers see this as a long-term or permanent commitment? And Clint, I'll throw that to you first. Sure. So the short answer is no. Uh, they certainly didn't see it as a, as a permanent commitment. Um, their preference was to find a way gradually to, to draw down the U.S. presence and sort of pass off more responsibility to Seoul uh, once it was able to take it on, uh, sort of if conditions allowed, the sort of broad um, condition or, or phrasing that you see in, in the policy documents at the time. Um, but there was, at the time that the alliance was formed uh, in 1954, a sort of fundamental clash in policy objectives at the heart of U.S.-Korea policy. The long range objective of US policy was to find a peaceful political path uh, toward a unified and independent uh, Korean peninsula. And that long-term objective has actually remained rather consistent since that time uh, with increased emphasis on reunification occurring under democratic and free market economic principles, which is really to say under South Korean auspices if you parse the language. Um, however, alongside that long range objective, there was also a short range objective which not only took precedence in the 1950s, but I would argue has essentially taken precedence since then. And that's namely to maintain US forces and to foster a position of allied strength to deter further uh, future aggression. Um, that short-term objective um, has held for nearly 70 years now. Of course, it's been successful in deterring another Korean war. However, uh, I'd, I'd also argue that it's it's not deter the development of increasingly advanced and, and fearsome uh, military capabilities on both sides uh, of the DMZ. And that same increased militarization uh, within this deterrence framework over time has made it, has profoundly constrained not just US, but US policymakers' um, sort of ability and willingness uh, 
to uh, reimagine a different sort of political relationship on the Korean Peninsula. Because so much time, effort, and resources have been put into deterrence, it sort of crowds out other possibilities. However, the last thing I'll say is that starting with the Eisenhower administration in the 50s, even right after the Korean War, and for successive US administrations thereafter, there was a driving idea that the US did ultimately want to, quote unquote, replace itself with its South Korean ally taking the reins. However, as we know, there are roughly 30,000 US forces still there today. It's never been able to fully do so, to fully replace itself. And there are a host of reasons for that, but I think we'll be, we'll be getting into those shortly. Richard, did you want to add to that? Yeah, I wanted to make uh, two comments, please, if I could. First of all, I think that uh, what Clint has done here is very useful, uh, particularly working backwards from the Carter administration and attempting to, and, and frankly, delivering quite well and explaining the entire evolution of our relationship there. One, one of the things that struck me, and I've been in one way or another, feet on the peninsula since 1967, I guess, and as one comes back intermittently or episodically, what you discover is somebody, people always have a piece of the understanding, but they don't necessarily have a holistic approach to understanding how this relationship evolved. And so I'm complimenting Clint on taking this entire relationship all the way back to 1954 and rolling it forward. And I think this is a very useful tool, and I really love the level of detail he's gone into. On your question, Jenny, I think it's very important to remember that in 1954, when indeed, as Clint said, we were looking for ways, the Eisenhower administration, to downsize or alter our relationship on the peninsula, we had two factors ongoing at that time. The armistice agreement really required both sides to not introduce new weapons and additionally attempted to forestall, if you will, aggression uh, from North Korea. What was happening in 54, 55, 56 was things were not panning out as we assumed they would. So the United States was very concerned about a renewal and an imbalance that was growing in terms of North Korean conventional forces, both in terms of capabilities and size. So many in the U.S. military planning structure and in the U.S. government were quite concerned that there would be a renewal, that the armistice would be broken and we could be at war again with North Korea uh, and communist China, perhaps, if not the Soviet Union, in that 54 to 57 period. So we really didn't have the flexibility to make the moves we would perhaps would otherwise have made had the terms of the alliance been observed by both sides. Lastly, what that led to, of course, was the introduction eventually of tactical nuclear weapons in part to redress that imbalance. But, but there really wasn't an opportunity for us to move out on a dedicated program simply because the conditions um, it, on the prospective battlefield did not allow. Thank you for that. And that, that sort of leads me to the next question here. Um, you know, this idea that, that the U.S. did see a future where the ROC would replace them and wanted to be able to, to get out of the region, but certainly didn't want to leave it vulnerable. And so I think, you know, the alliance and the U.S. force presence on the Korean Peninsula over time has shown, as Clint mentioned earlier, this extreme stickiness. Uh, despite changing U.S. rock presidential administrations and ebbs and flows in political relations. And so I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about why it's been so resilient, what has caused this resilience, um, as well as what the rationale has been for keeping U.S. troops there even today and how this calculus has changed over time. Clint, we'll go to you first. Sure, I will try to make this brief. I have so much to say in response to this. Um, I, you know, I don't want to keep us mired in, in the late 40s and 1950s, but it is crucial to just return to the Korean War briefly um, and to highlight what I see, and I'm not alone in this, uh, two really important sort of catalyzing outcomes of the Korean War. The first of those is that it inextricably linked the U.S. military commitment to South Korea with the political commitment to South Korea. 
it transformed what had been sort of a minimum commitment before the outbreak of the Korean War into a, a maximum one, characterized by a mutual defense treaty on the one side and the forward uh, deployment of U.S. forces on the peninsula. And it was really the, the presence of those forces that gave the treaty heft and meaning, it, almost to the point where without those forces, the treaty was meaningless in light of the experience of the Korean War. Uh, the second key catalyzing effect of that war is that it, it really firmly linked the U.S. presence on the peninsula with wider U.S. strategic and foreign policy objectives. And so over time, uh, these two linkages that I've just uh, highlighted are time and again cited uh, as reasons to sort of temper or slow down or cur curtail efforts to reduce or realign, or again, in the case of Carter, sort of fully withdraw at least ground forces from the Korean Peninsula. So just to get a little more specific. Um, so in regards to North Korea, changing the US force presence risks, or it's feared it risks, loosening deterrence or Pyongyang's perception of deterrence, because deterrence is as much psychological as it is as material, sort of potentially causing North Korean adventurism or provocations and potential escalation to a wider conflict, to which, of course, the U.S. is still treaty bound to respond. Uh, the other concern that arises is that when the U.S. force presence is changed, it requires uh, of necessity that South Korea ramp up its own capabilities and sort of take a more robust role in its own defense, take on key defense missions. Uh, at the same time, though, the very process of U.S. force reductions causes distinct concerns, existential concerns among some in Seoul about U.S. abandonment. So this process, it leads to Seoul being given both the capability and the incentive to take a more sort of self-sufficient or autonomous posture vis-a-vis -vis both the U.S. and North Korea. And this raises concern among U.S. policymakers, and you can trace this in every case, and I have. Um, it raises concern over maybe a potential overly aggressive retaliatory response from Seoul against a North Korean provocation, or possibly Seoul's development of its own indigenous nuclear deterrent. Um, I, I would just add to that, policymakers, U.S. policymakers are often just as, if not more concerned about the wider spillover effects of changes in Korea. Uh, and this includes, you know, Japanese insecurity and potential sort of rapid rearmament, arms racing and proliferation throughout the region, uh, you know, potentially sparking greater skepticism about the U.S. credibility of commitment writ large, sort of on a global scale. And, and full withdrawal from Korea is, has really been framed as unthinkable, and, and many people have used that exact expression over the decades, because ultimately it, it sort of untethers what has been a longstanding strategic imperative of U.S. policy in, in Asia, and that is to prevent any other power from establishing exclusive hegemonic uh, control over the region. And the view is that if you come out of Korea, it'll eventually sort of pull the, the, the key, the, the arch stone, uh, the keystone out of the arch and it sort of tumbles and, and, and all these larger imperatives become in peril, they're undermined. Um, I do have some other sort of changing calculuses or calculi that I might highlight, but maybe I'll just toss it to Richard first. So I don't, I don't drone on too long. Please, Richard. Thank you. Uh, I'll try to stay out of the Korean War trap, but um, it's almost inevitable you get sucked back into it. But one of the lessons learned, and I think this is really important to understand, is we had a, once we put the uh, defense treaty, the mutual uh, defense treaty in place with Korea, we had a political commitment. And that political commitment to defend Korea overlaid continuously by the UN mandate and uh, the UN armistice uh, that uh, the United Nations was. Um, essentially presiding over and giving its half to, and the United States was determined to support that United Nations commitment, we really had no choice but to maintain a suitable presence in the Korean, on the Korean Peninsula just to allow ourselves to execute the commitments we had made under that treaty. We had learned a lesson from the Korean War that if we did not have people there, but we were still committed to fight uh, on, in Korea, uh, we did not want to be fighting from the Pusan perimeter again, where we were almost thrown off the peninsula. Uh, the requirement for the United States to fight in a situation where we had another North Korean aggression required a massive force flow from the United States, possibly from Europe, uh, literally hundreds of thousands of men 
in the operational plans that we had to fight that next war in Korea, if you will. Doing so absent the presence of at least one division or two divisions to hold the line, if you will, until we could get there with the balance of the operation plan that required us to deliver these hundreds of thousands of people to fight in Korea would have otherwise been impossible. So we really were tethered to our defense and national security commitment in a sense of if we were gonna fight in Korea, we certainly didn't want to have to do it the way we did it in 1950. We would have to do it the way that our operations plan allowed us to flow the forces there over a two to three to four week period and be able to execute. So in the mind of the military planners, there was really no choice but to stay on the peninsula in force and to stay where we were. So I'll just add that little commentary there, but it's, it's something that's sometimes overlooked when we have this discussion about the withdrawal of forces. Yeah, I, I would just quickly piggyback on that, what, just because Richard's comment sparked a thought, and, and I note this in, in different writings, is that at no point in time, even in Carter's case, where he wanted to remove all U.S. ground forces, he still intended to keep the numbers vary, 12 to 15,000, mostly air, naval, logistics, intelligence capabilities, in large, in large part to do what, what uh, Richard just referenced, which is to help uh, facilitate force flow back onto the peninsula. Um, at no point, even in Carter's case, was there ever discussion of abrogating the, the mutual defense treaty. So it, it raises questions of, are we beginning to pull back in a way where we're still treaty bound, but we're less uh, equipped to respond in a crisis scenario? Like there's, and, and U.S. policymakers have, have never been able to really determine where exactly that threshold or line is, where it's too far. Um but there's always this concern about there's a certain point beyond which we don't want to untether this because then we're still bound to respond, but we're not fully equipped to do so based on the assessment of, of military, uh, you know, of, of field commanders and military strategists. Um, and certainly I, the concerns that South Koreans have now, especially when seeing what's happened in Afghanistan and, and seeing what's happening in Ukraine now, I'm sure that's it's a concern that's very alive in South Korean calculations these days. Yeah, I mean, I I wrote a, an article, not to sort of toot my own horn, but I, I wrote an article in Foreign Policy saying that Seoul, Kabul isn't Seoul. And one of the key distinctions I drew was just the depth of the alliance relationship between the US and South Korea, but also the fact that there is this political commitment, this mutual defense treaty, which is also nested in a larger UN collective defense, uh, defense framework. Um, you know, there have always been concerns in South Korea about potential U.S. abandonment. And that is, again, not to get back in the Korean War trap, but that is because of those events. And, and even deeper, deeper uh, historical instances where they thought they were betrayed or abandoned by the U.S. But I'm, I'm not going to go back 100 uh, years right now. Um, could I, Jenny, do you mind if I just quickly touch on sort of the changing calculi that you asked about? Just really quickly. So, one, one general sort of larger change in calculus, of course, is, is the shift from the Cold War, the ending of the Cold War, right? So when I talk about the sort of broader strategic framework or calculus, of course, for much of the relationship, it was within the larger bipolar confrontation. When that waned and dissipated in the late 80s and early 90s, the Bush HW and HW Bush administration produced strategic reports on, on the region, which highlighted what they called the, the regional role of US forces on the peninsula, which, which these documents refer to as, as in fact the more traditional role. Uh, and the documents talked about how the Cold War bipolar logic sort of veiled this regional role, but it had always been there. Some people claim that this was sort of inventing new reasons to maintain a presence that was no longer justified. I actually would disagree with that and say you could see these logics in early State Department documents going back to 1943. Um, the other sort of changing calculus, and, and uh, Richard could speak to this a bit as well, is there's been further efforts by U.S. policymakers to enhance the so-called strategic flexibility of U.S. forces on the peninsula, which is to say their potential deployment on and off the peninsula to other crises or contingencies in the region. Um, now, this does go back all the way to 1964, Dean Rusk, the Secretary of State for both Kennedy and Johnson wanted to increase the strategic flexibility of U.S. forces. 
it's become much more realistic a possibility these days, though, because of how much more of the burden Seoul has taken on and how U.S. forces have been sort of repostured on Penn. However, politically speaking, it's a very contentious issue, and it's one that the allies do have not come to agreement on uh, in any really substantial way. And then, and I'll stop after this, Jenny. The, the last calculus is, is obviously the fact that North Korea's advancement in its nuclear and missile capabilities has totally transformed the extended deterrence equation. What was before extended deterrence, which is to say deterring or coming to the defense of, of our ally in South Korea, is now a question of potentially direct strikes on the continental United States. So, you know, and on the one hand, this actually increases U.S. involvement, but it also raises new questions about whether or not, sort of referencing the Cold War, whether or not the U.S. would, would risk Seattle to save Seoul. Well, that, that's a perfect segue into our next question. Um, and that is this idea of the US nuclear umbrella extended deterrence, knowing that there are growing calls in South Korea for it to have its own nuclear weapons program and not be solely dependent on US nuclear umbrella and US decision making on the use of nuclear weapons uh, in the case of crisis. Um, you know, Richard, we know that under Park chung hee South Korea had pursued a clandestine nuclear weapons program that was eventually abandoned. But what can we learn from South Korea's previous attempt to acquire nuclear weapons that can help inform what we're seeing today? Well, first of all, I think we were very fortunate uh, in the mid 1970s to have uh, taken down that program uh, before it really reached any level of uh, fruition and any level of, uh, let's call it regional disruption. Uh, had we not done so, unfortunately, uh, at the point in time that it was terminated, had they continued that program, it actually would have segued perfectly into Jimmy Carter's decision to withdraw from the peninsula and actually reinforced the original decision taken in 19. Three to create the independent covert strategic weapons deterrence, and um, so we we got lucky in that situation. The driving force then was very much related to our situation in Vietnam, the Nixon Doctrine, excuse me, and um, basically a concern that that strategic deterrent we had there was not necessarily credible in the longer term. Remember that at that point. We still had tactical nuclear weapons in Korea, in fact, hundreds of them. But the presumption was that the United States could leave tomorrow, ground force wise. And if they left, they would take those tactical nuclear weapons with them. And basically, South Korea would be abandoned. And if you're a prudent leader and had a calculation, as did Park Chung Hee, that the United States deterrence, strategic deterrence, was not viable over even the middle term, then you had no choice but to develop your own nuclear deterrence. And I think that um, that was the motivating factor then. So the question is, given the North Korean situation now, uh, is there not a impetus to that same mindset that says, is the extended deterrence, meaning the nuclear deterrent, still viable from the United States? Is that still on offer or is it still credible? And therefore, if it isn't, if there's the slightest chance that it is not credible, which I think is in the minds of many Koreans, then we have to have our own uh, ultimate deterrence related to uh, North Korea. So it's very, um, I, I think that there are, there's some differences, but there are many similarities today to that decision and that mindset of the Koreans. And Clint and I were just discussing before the program began the new poll that is out, and I think it's a reasonably accurate one, that puts the percentage of Koreans that would, South Koreans that would favor the development of an indigenous or sovereign nuclear deterrent somewhere around 70%. Um, that's a remarkable uh, percentage. And even if you discounted that substantially, uh, it is a significant shift in attitude on the part of the South Korean pol body politic, I think. Richard, before, before we go to Clint, actually, if I could push back just a little bit and ask, you know, if 
if the perception was at that time, if South Korea had not given up its pursuit of nuclear weapons, that the U.S. would have withdrawn and that um, do you see that as a likely outcome today if North Korea were if South Korea were to um, were to actually move forward with a indigenous nuclear weapons program, would it are the conditions similar enough now that the U.S. would make that decision to sever ties? No, I do not believe so. I, I think that that issue can be contained by a very active engagement with the new government that's coming into the Republic of Korea. This issue is very closely tied to, I believe, domestic politics. It has to do with a progressive versus a conservative regime and how that regime or how that, excuse me, government views the alliance and how it manages the alliance from the Korean side, not the US side. But that level of uncertainty is still there and there is still very strong, credible concern about uh, the credibility of the US nuclear deterrent. And I think this will only continue in the future. Clint, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. yeah, Jenny, I would just just add to that. Um, that's wonderful historical context. But just looking at the the 2010s, and um, so the U.S. extended deterrence commitment consists of the remaining forces on Penn, the conventional strike capabilities they have, missile defense assets, but also, of course, the U.S. nuclear umbrella, sort of the key piece, right? And and as the U.S. has gradually reduced and realigned further south its forces. And the rocks by design have taken on the overwhelming uh, sort of conventional side of deterrence. Um, it's shed greater light on that one piece that they're not bringing to bear, which is the US nuclear umbrella. And I think North Korea's, you know, the, the advancement in North Korea's capabilities is such that, you know, the, the, the operational plans that, that Richard referenced before of, you know, ten, hundreds of thousands of, of you know, forward flown US forces to the peninsula in the case of a war. North Korean missile capabilities make the ability to flow those forces to the pen very, very problematic. In other words, they've got to go with what they, the alliance has to go with what it has on pen. Um, and since 2010, there have been really discordant and sort of clashing engagements between the two allies. On the one hand, when North Korea has provoked, in the case of the, the Chonan sinking or Young Pyongdo, the perception on the, on the part of ROC uh, officials is that the U.S. has is more concerned about restraining Seoul than it is about the North Korean aggression. It's not that the, the Americans aren't concerned about North Korean aggression, but they're more concerned about too retaliatory a response. And I've talked to former commanders who said this exact thing. Um, so I'm not sort of divining this. Um, the other piece is the more skeptical they've become about the US extended deterrence commitment, the nuclear umbrella, the more they've, they've sort of asked for greater consultation on this. And Alliance watchers know even for the best of us, it's really difficult to keep track of this dizzying array of new consultative mechanisms that, that have emerged to talk about the extended deterrence commitment. Um, and on the one hand, it does show an earnest effort to cooperate more, but I think it veils a really troubling lack of cohesion about these issues. So we're cooperating more, we're talking about them, but in some ways talking past each other. And the ROCs request more and more information about US nuclear use. And and they essentially get the, the same response, which is don't worry, we'll come to your defense, but there's not much information given them. So they're asking for more nuclear sharing. They're asking for return of TAC nukes. They're asking for any bit more information that might reassure them more, none of which Democratic or Republican presidents have been willing to give. And we see with Yoon suk Yeol, he's saying we need to reinvigorate these very same consultative mechanisms, which is indicative of the fact that they haven't been doing their job, right? or we need to develop a strategic command. So this has not gone away. And he's also talking about ramping up the ROC's own preventative or preemptive strike capabilities. It's three access defense system, um, things that sometimes drive concern among US policymakers, depending on exactly how they're supposed to be conceptualized. Let me, uh, let me add one thing. Um, I think if you stand back, what Clint is describing is almost a sine curve. And um, we sort of lapse into a period of alliance management that sort of suits both sides. And then all of a sudden things resurface, either external forces or internal forces, be they American domestic political, in the case of Jimmy Carter, or in the case of a progressive regime in the Republic of Korea, such as we just had, or, st or still have until, until the turnover of power. But the one other aspect of this I think is very interesting, and that is, it's interesting when you talk to North Koreans, the degree to which 
they single out another country as probably more important to their defeat in the Korean War and their concern, and that is Japan. And that is because everything we did in the Korean War came out of Japan, and Japan is critical to the defense of the Republic of Korea. Not only in the context of the United Nations Command rear area basing in Japan, but just the ability to project from Japan to defend the Republic of Korea, whether or not South Korea wishes to acknowledge the degree of dependency that their defense has on Japan. So if we look at that force flow, whatever it is today, it certainly isn't what it used to be, the degree that Pyongyang can now hold Japan and US bases in Japan and the US ability to flow through Japan to a conflict in Korea, I think is extremely important because they can do that today and they did not have that ability even 10 years ago. It's a really important point and, and one that you know does raise anxieties in, in South Korea. And I, I think there's, Clinton and I have been involved in a lot of conversations lately where there have been American policy analysts who don't understand why the South Koreans aren't fully reassured because we do have troops there. And I think it's issues like that um, that really highlight the complexity of the issue um, and, and all of the, the factors that South Korea doesn't have control over in case of a crisis. Um, this does bring us to our next question, which is about wartime operational control. Um, and the transition of, of OPCON is something that has been under consideration for decades and has been continually kicked down the road over and over. Um, so even now, the conditions for OPCON transition have been widely criticized as being overly subjective to the point where the evaluation of whether those conditions have been met is really difficult to assess. Um, so I think the, the question here becomes, you know, how important is OPCON transition, wartime OPCON transition to the future of the alliance? What happens if we don't um, go through with this? Clint, I'll throw that to you first. Yeah, uh, as you know, I have an endless amount to say about this, but I'll try to keep it simple. So this is a really key piece for me to sort of understanding the deeper patterns in the alliance. It's sort of a keynote within the, the wider set of issues. and. I look at the evolutionary trajectory of the, the Alliance command architecture. And so uh, not just the official agreements um, that are bilaterally agreed to, but the sort of subjective and informal understandings about them. And both ROC and US policymakers, and, and there's a lot of evidence to back this up, have, have viewed the command architecture following a certain evolutionary trajectory. It started by design as a hierarchical arrangement that the US sort of insisted upon, uh, not only for war fighting and, and deterrence purposes, but also to sort of institute, not sort of, to institutionalize an asymmetric alliance to maintain a distinct amount of control over their smaller South Korean ally. This was born of their difficulties with Yi Sing Man during the Korean War and over the armistice negotiations and his, his perpetual uh, sort of claims to be to, to threats to march north. However, it was not was supposed to remain this way forever. And it did evolve starting in the late 60s, but really in the 70s towards a bilaterally mutually agreed to combined arrangement, uh, which was much more integrated, um, much more cooperative, and essentially give or take 50% ROC, 50% US officials in, in the command structure with of course a US four star remaining um, uh, atop, atop the structure in terms of uh, operational control. However, that, that was devised, the Combined Forces Command, amidst Carter's uh, withdrawal policy. And it was viewed at that time, and, and sort of my research shows this, as a transitional arrangement that would evolve to some third generation arrangement down the road. And U.S. policy documents show that the U.S. US sort of belief that this would move towards a third generation arrangement where the rocks would take a more of a lead role but that it had to still retain some sort of restraining mechanism vis-a-vis -vis the South Koreans. And this really opened up after the Korean War and that same regional strategy that I cited before uh, of the George H.W. Bush administration said explicitly that the U.S. wanted to move from a leading to a supporting role in regards to the command uh, architecture. And eventually it, it, 
in the second or third phases of, of the sort of strategy it laid out to disestablish the combined forces command and move towards uh, some sort of different arrangement. And it was under uh, under Richard and, and the George W. Bush administration where the alliance really devised a concrete plan to do just that, to disestablish the combined forces command and to create two parallel command structures with the ROC in the lead and the US as a supporting command with various combined linkages to maintain synchronization during wartime. This plan was, was actually really deliberately furthered from about 2007 to 2013, at which point it was jettisoned to move back towards a combined arrangement. Um, and since then, there's been a really unsynchronized sort of ad hoc policy environment in terms of negotiating what the next step will be. The plan currently bilaterally agreed to is conditions based towards a future rock led combined uh, architecture. Um, and there are various conditions that have to be met in terms of uh, capability acquisitions, but also an environment on and around the Korean Peninsula that's conducive to the transfer, which is a very subjective sort of framing. Um, and I, just talking to rock insiders, and, and, and I'll stop after this, Jenny, is the, the reflection that in the earlier period under, under the plan that Richard had, had a large role in, in devising, the U.S. was deliberately helping stand up the rocks, helping them posture up to really take a lead role. Since then, the feeling is that they're standing there with the clipboard, telling them that they're not hitting the marks, but not assisting them to meet them. And so this has led to a great deal of sort of talking past one another, frustration, mutual misunderstandings about what this will look like. Um, I think for the health of the alliance, they need both the U.S. and the ROC really need to dig down on this and move forward with it. It is officially agreed to bilateral official alliance policy that successive U.S. ROC administrations, presidents, and the highest civilian defense officials have agreed to. I think it's high time that we, we move this forward. And I think a lot of potentially productive things can come out of that, but I'll, but I'll stop there because I'm droning on yet again. <laughs> Richard, did you have anything to add? Oh, you're muted still. I don't want to consume all your time, and I know you're running against a clock, and you probably to speak. I don't fully agree with Clint that we're standing there with a clipboard, but it certainly has. It appears that it's evolved to that point, and um, but I do think the reason we're standing there with a clipboard is that we have a lot of uniformed senior people retired and a very strong um, community, if you will, or cadre of people in Republic of Korea that are extremely happy with the status quo and would love to see us go to status quo ante. So I think that is part of the, that only can be resolved at the level of national security and presidential leadership to move this process forward. It will never move forward at the level that the dialogue is taking place now. Just to play devil's advocate really quickly, Jenny, and 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 push back a little bit against what Richard said, um, ag agreed. Uh, that's what a rock counterpart told me was the perception of certain people in in South Korea. Uh, I'm not necessarily how I how I view it, although I am somewhat sympathetic to that view. Um, the other piece I would say, and just to second what you said, Richard, is there is a large constituency within South Korea that does not want to take on wartime operational control. In fact, in the wake of uh, the, the bilaterally agreed to parallel structure that, that uh, Richard helped negotiate, scores of retired uh, ROC uh, officers and generals and admirals protested in the streets not to take this back on. In fact, it was one of the things that I found so quizzical that made me want to look at it because I thought it was strange for a country's generals not to want to have operational control over their own military. Of course, learning the history, I understand there's a lot more nuance to this, but it is a remarkable fact, and it's one that that uh, is still salient today, to Richard's point. And, and Yoon suk Yeol, you can see in his discourse, it's it, it, the tension about we want to expedite this, but we also don't want to rush it, uh, you know, because it could be destabilizing in the face of North Korea's advancing capabilities. So I would expect the Yoon administration, depending on which advisors get into which positions, to try to stem this and, and redirect it in some way. Uh, so we, we could very well see it yet again kicked down the road, which I'm not adverse to, but I think the Alliance, if they're gonna do that, 
they really need to communicate this very clearly and not only with one another, but but to the wider publics on both sides to make it more definitive what direction we're going. Because I don't think we can continue to do this sort of what direction are we going um, sort of policy drift. And certainly we have seen the shifts between liberal administrations and conservative administrations on this issue and the importance of Afghan transition with the liberals pushing more for this as an issue of sovereignty um, versus actual defense. So um, I do want to move to the audience. So the audience, if you do have questions, please feel free to put them in the Q&A box. There are a few here already. So um, the first question is from Jeffrey Robertson, and he is asking, he would like to hear um, more about the periods when South Korea has tested the relationship. Um, for example, during negotiations for the treaty request for funding for troops to Vietnam, pursuit of nuclear weapons, et cetera, how, and how serious were these tests on the alliance itself? Clint, why don't we start with you? Richard, oh, oh, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, that's a good question. I, I think, uh, I mean, I, I referenced before, Yi Sing Man was as shrewd a, a, a who, for those who don't know, was South Korea's um, first president, um, was as shrewd a calculator as there, as there was in terms of maximizing what he could get out of the U.S. in terms of its commitment. And he did so um, by making, uh, ending the war uh, and, and signing an armistice as difficult a process as he could without fully and completely alienating uh, the U.S. and uh, he, he did this in various ways, uh, most notably, you know, letting twenty thousand some odd communist prisoners of war out of out of uh, jails as uh, in, in South Korea, just as negotiations that were supposed to be sort of repa repatriated uh, back to back to the north or to, or to China in a way to disrupt negotiations, and he, and he was doing this. Uh, one, because he wanted the U.S. to complete the war and unify the peninsula under Republic of Korea auspices, but also because even, even though he knew that was very unlikely, he wanted to secure a formal mutual defense treaty from the U.S., which he had wanted before the war and hadn't gotten. Um, I, you know, I think also the, the, the South Koreans drove a very hard bargain, and I'd be interested to hear Richard's thoughts on this around the, around the Vietnam War. Um, when uh, you know, President Johnson and his More Flags campaign trying to garner allied contributions to the war in Vietnam, the South Koreans then also uh, leveraged their position and the U.S. need for allies uh, to a, a enormously productive effect, um, not only garnering it, it, very important combat experience for their own military, but really billions of dollars in, in, in different ways in, uh, in sort of... Um, not only the, the first international contracts for some of the Korean chaebols, Hyundai and Samsung, some of the first international contracts were in Vietnam, um, but also, you know, sort of boosted pay for ROC soldiers who went there um, and also guarantees to keep U.S. forces in Korea if, you know, if, if the, the Koreans uh, sent some divisions to Vietnam. Um, so those are those are two earlier tests. Um, I'll, I'll stop there because I'm sure Richard has insight on this. Yes, I think <clears throat> I, I agree with your comments on Lee Sung Man. Um, I'm much more familiar with the Pak Chung Hee period, and I think he was um, when we uh, when we required or requested help in Vietnam. It was a highly transactional relationship that not only uh, involved the military sphere and, and requirements for us to double down, if you will, on our commitments in the Republic of Korea, including um, weapons transfers and sales and the beefing up of the Korean military. But it really, from Pak Chung-hee's and the incredible talent that he had with him, uh, around him, allowed them to leverage that Vietnam commitment across the board in every economic sphere. Uh, whether it was expand, dramatically expanded credits from um, the USXM Bank to empower uh, the uh, development of heavy industry in Korea, uh, all of which went against the grain of you know, World Bank economists who said, you can't do this. And Pak Chung-hee basically said, I'm going to do it, and I'm going to do it mostly with American money. And um, I, I just give him uh, incredible credit for being able to do that, but he was leveraging 
um, the entire uh, Vietnam commitment and beyond. So I think it's a really interesting question that was raised. And I think not necessarily the others have done as well, but Pak Chung, he was a master at, uh, at uh, leveraging and transacting that particular phase of history. Yeah, he, he also did it with some Japanese money as well. Um, <laughs> And they and, and Hyundai and Samsung, they, they took that experience in Vietnam and then went to the Middle East during the construction boom there because of the, the sort of uh, just the, the oil wealth that accrued from uh, you know, what was an oil crisis for them was sort of a, a boon for the oil producing countries, of course, in terms of, of their, uh, their profits. And that was poured into construction and, and rock firms took up a lot of those contracts, which they then, of course, uh, used back uh, in the Republic of Korea's own heavy industrialization. But I, but I will say one more point. Um, during that same period, we had incredible frustrations delivered to Pak. We had Blue House raid. We had the Pueblo incident. We had a number mm -hmm. of a near war situation across the DMZ where we were losing uh, dozens, if not hundreds of people a year. And Pak Chung-hee was in uh, his inner circle extremely frustrated that the United States was not willing to um, retaliate in kind. Yeah, I, I, I sorry, Jenny, I just, this is, go Jenny, I'll, I'll stop. I was say, this actually segues really well into the next question. It does, uh, yeah. Which comes from David Maxwell. Uh, and so he asks, when did we begin the period of self-deterrence? And by this, I mean, when did we begin to constrain ourselves and the U.S. Rock Alliance from effectively responding to North Korean hostile actions out of fear of the North Korean threat to Seoul or the tyranny of proximity? Have we deterred ourselves more than we actually deter North Korea? And how has this self-deterrence contributed to the North Korean incentive to develop and field advanced military capabilities to support its hostile policies of political warfare, blackmail, diplomacy, and potential future use of force to dominate the peninsula? So Clint, I think you were about to say something. I'm sure it's yep. a lot of these lines anyway. So yeah, <laughs> David, I, I will just tell you right now, I'm not gonna be able to answer all those questions, <laughs> but, I, but I'll start with the first part and, and it piggybacks off of exactly what Richard was ending with. And, and I wanted to mention this earlier, it was that period that Richard references is, is referred to often as the second Korean war. And it spans from about 66 to 69. And there was an enormous number of provocations across the DMZ. It, majority of them coming from north to south, but there were also those from south to north as well. Um, and some of the the, the larger ones, uh, you know, were the Blue House raid, the seizure of the U.S. Pueblo, the shooting down of the of the U.S. EC-121 in the spring of 1969. And it was actually these events, among other factors, that led to the first really in-depth study, interagency study, and then formal recommendations to reduce US forces from the Korean Peninsula after the Korean War. And it, it started under Johnson and it was picked up by the Nixon administration and they eventually removed one of the two remaining infantry divisions. And it was these, uh, these provocations that alerted to them, of course, in the context of Vietnam. In fact, it was the Pueblo and the Blue House raid happened at the same time that the Tet Offensive was occurring. So it really reinforced this, this concern about the the potential for sudden and escalation on the Korean Peninsula and the need to sort of rethink how our forces were postured in order to give us more flexibility of response uh, to make a more credible deterrent, but also to not get immediately caught up in, in escalation. Um, and I think our self-deterrence, as, as David asked about, began, I think, really around the, the negotiating of the armistice, to be, to be perfectly frank, but I think it really was sort of renewed and reconstituted, it, it reconstituted in, that la, in that later 1960s period. And one thing I'll say, maybe this gets a little bit at what David was, was saying, but one thing when you look at some of the internal um, discussions between Kissinger and Nixon and some other uh, officials around the EC-121 shootdown is how to respond to this provocation. And they found this dilemma, and I think this still exists today, of we don't, we don't want to respond too much because we're afraid of escalation. But, but if that's the case, it's not really a, a fearsome or, or credible retaliation. It doesn't impose enough cost. So we don't necessarily want to do that. And the only other threat we can make is, is sort of full on, going to full on sort of nuclear war, which is so enormous a threat that it's almost not credible because it's so disproportionate. So there's this vast space between low-level provocation 
and God forbid nuclear war, that they could never really navigate where, where to, to enter into because the threats of, of escalation. And I think the North Koreans have studied this over the years. And I think frankly, that you know, sort of Young Pyongdo and some of these other provocations and God forbid, maybe some coming are their attempt to exploit this. And when this happens and the response is seen as, as not, you know, uh, proportionate enough, or, or if the U.S. is more concerned about restraining the rocks, this adds more to sort of fissures and, and distrust in the alliance. Um, so given the time, there's a, a few questions that are all kind of in the same category and we'll sort of lump them together here. And it's this idea of, uh, you know, is it, is our purpose in South Korea these days, especially, um, about South Korea, or is it more about having a regional foothold um, in the Asian sphere that offers U.S. strategic advantage over China, Russia, Japan, and the ability to control choke points throughout the region? And so the, the sort of common question among several of our um, attendees is really that, um, you know, how important is the U.S. ROC Alliance to any future efforts to develop a regional security architecture in Northeast Asia? Um, and what role does it really play outside of just the defense of Korea? Uh, Richard, maybe I could turn to you first. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a, a, a doubting Thomas on any ability to create a regional security architecture. Um, just simply because the historical uh, passions and other animosities, uh, the wheel and uh, spoke approach is probably the only one that works. However, um, the analogy was used in one of Clint's papers, and it's actually one that, that I followed over the years, is really we're in the Republic of Korea as almost a control rod in a nuclear reactor. And the second that control rod is lifted, even partially, uh, we begin to lose control of the entire dynamic of Northeast Asia, I think. So if it is not just the North Korean threat, of course, and the North Korean threat vis-a-vis -vis Japan, a treaty ally, it's also the China dynamic. I don't think we have as many um, dissing or departing or demasking the relationship with the Republic of Korea that we had 10 years ago. It's probably more critical now uh, to be there and to find a solution, a longer term solution, as Clint says, uh, so that we can sustain our presence there and do so as a true integrated ally. Uh, I don't just see any advantage in any precipitous or even staged withdrawal from the Republic of Korea in the relationship. So I think it's more critical to Northeast Asia security stability than it's ever been in the past, incredibly so. And Clint, I'll give you the last word. We're running out of time. Yeah, the only I, I tend to share, uh, you know, Richard's doubt about our sort of regional architecture for all the historical and geographic reasons that people know so well, especially sort of contra Europe, and we see the problems Europe's having. Um, what I would say is, I think one positive development, and this doesn't preclude a strong rock U.S. rock alliance. In fact, I think it would strengthen it is for the, the South Koreans to really bolster their own independent efforts to improve their relationship without US involvement with Japan, with Australia, with New Zealand, with other partners in the region. Um, and again, this is, it's not as though this isn't happening, but, but really to look for new ways to do that and to find sort of a dynamic uh, sort of comparative advantage that, that each, each country or partner brings to bear uh, in, in this relationship, because we, at the end of the day, we are moving towards whether we like it or not. Um, hopefully not a war between US and China, but there is going to be a long-term showdown here. And so we really need to rethink about how relations, uh, how, how you know, uh, our, our allies and partners, not only we orient ourselves to them, but, but look for creative ways to encourage them working together without, without US leadership, because at the end of the day, it's not 1946 anymore. We don't have endless resources. We don't have half the world's productive capacity. And we have candidates like Trump who come up and, and say we need to withdraw from the world. So, and there's no, there's no possibility that, there's a distinct possibility he could run again too, not to make this too political, but there are those attitudes. And so domestic politics matter here as well as they do in, in South Korea. So on that rosy note, I'll, I'll stop. <laughs>
Richard, it looks like you want to say one more thing. You know, the only finishing comment I would make is somehow, uh, not because we encourage them to or not because um, we're demanding it, but I think the Republic of Korea has to stop looking over its shoulder at China and worrying about China so much. Uh, during the last administration, it was a mother may I approach to everything that related to the alliance. And it simply cannot be that way. I would love for the Republic of Korea to have the same disdain for the Chinese and Beijing that North Korea has. It would be a welcome development. Another tricky issue that would take us a long time to get into um, that we don't have time for tonight, but actually next week uh, on the 31st, we'll be part of that discussion as well um, as the role that China plays um, in you know, future alliance decisions. And I just want to thank Clint and thank Richard for speaking tonight. This was a fascinating discussion. Um, it will be recorded. It is being recorded. It'll be available afterwards for those that are interested. Um, but uh, And thank you to our audience for coming today. Um, and we hope to see you next week as well. Thanks, everyone.